Hi friends. Um, I am going to, we are going to um, read just one chapter today and it's fairly short and that's chapter 44. And the reason I'm doing that is 45 is a bit on the long side and I think 44 and 45 together would be too long. So one kind of short chapter, 44. Share screen. This is a long one um, from John Adams in a letter to Abigail Adams. And the date is Wednesday, March 18th sun to Sunday, March 22nd, 1778. This curious character of a barber, I have a great inclination to draw for your amusement. He is a little dapper fellow, a tongue as fluent and voluble as you please, wit at will, and a memory or an invention which never leaves him at a loss for a story to tell you for your entertainment. He has dressed hair and shaved face at Bath Net Court. He is a sergeant in one of the companies of some battalion or other here. I assure you, I'm glad to chat with this barber while he is shaving and combing me to divert myself from less agreeable thoughts. I examined everything that Gideon, excuse me. I examined everything that Gideon owned the next morning when he drove Isabel to her duties at Mrs. Shippen's. He possessed three blankets, four fine shirts, two extra pair of breeches with expensive knee buckles, and a blade for shaving his face. I found nothing that gave an indication of his character. No cards or gaming pieces, nothing for praying or for sport or for remembering someone far away. The only curious thing was a letter folded small and hidden inside his second best breeches. Mrs. Cook once asked Gideon to read a page of a newspaper her to her when Isabel was busy. Gideon had said then that he could not read. I couldn't either, so I had no idea what the letter contained or who, it sent, who, what? or who sent it or why he would keep such a thing. I carefully folded it again and hid it back into the breeches. After that, I kept track of the amount of time Gideon spent on errands to headquarters or the market stalls on Sullivan's Bridge. More than half the time he tarried, sometimes returning much later than he ought. He was never spoken to about this. The gentleman and Mrs. Cook all assumed he was doing the wishes of one of the generals or aides to his excellency. As his real master was a day's ride away, there was no true accounting of his comings and goings. I suspected he was courting a girl, one of Lady Washington's maids, or a girl who worked for one of the regiments because her father or brother served in the company. I hoped it meant he was courting a girl, for Isabel was becoming too familiar with him. She allowed him to stand disrespectfully close when they talked and laughed when he tried to be funny, though he never said a single clever thing. I was beginning to loathe all things about Gideon. Winter returned with a bitter vengeance on the 22nd day of March, 37 days after Bellingham stole my life from me. Congressmen Dana and Folsom refused to let the thick ice on the road in front of Moore Hall interfere with their plans to leave for New York that morning. Gideon and I wrapped rope around our shoes to give us a better grip on the road as we carried their trunks and boxes to the wagon. Though normally a strong enough fellow, Gideon struggled with his end. He coughed heavily and shook with chills when I was warm enough from our exertions to be sweating. Have you had the smallpox? I asked him. I do not have the smallpox. You look sickly to me. Gideon ignored me. Go upstairs and turn the mattress in the green's bedroom, bedchamber. Make sure Isabel has dusted and cleaned the windows. He paused to cough some more. I'm off with the wagon to collect their belongings. If the room's not ready when I return, the blame is all yours. General Nathaniel Green and his young wife were moving into the empty bedchamber. General Green was taking over the quartermaster general's position and would be in charge of purchasing and delivering the food and other requirements for the army. By fetching their belongings, Gideon was wasting no time assuming the role as the general's manservant. After I turned the mattress, there was wood to be split, manure to be shoveled in the barn, and all manner of chores requested by Mrs. Cook. A fat-nosed junior officer delivered a message for Bellingham mid-morning and said he was instructed to wait for a reply. I'd been so busy that I'd lo lost track of Bellingham. I did not think he was at Moore Hall. He was not in the parlor or dining room. They said he was here, the lad insisted. I can't go back without a response. I'll wait in the kitchen. 
I took the stairs two at a time, determined to prove the fellow wrong. I opened the door of Bellingham's bedchamber without knocking, so certain was I that the room would be empty. I was wrong. Bellingham sat in the chair, a tile, towel tied around his neck and his face well soaked on one side. Isabel stood next to the chair, the lathering brush in her hand. Bellingham was not pleased. Since when do you enter my chamber without knocking? Apology, sir, I said hastily. A messenger has come from General Varnum. He requires that you write a reply. We'll have to wait then, Bellingham answered. I'm in need of a shave and Gideon won't be back for hours. I could have helped you, sir. I did not want your help, Bellingham motioned to Isabel. Finish this side, please. She dipped the brush in the soapy water, then leaned over to rub it on Bellingham's face. Shall I fetch paper and pen so you can write your reply, sir? I asked. General Varnum is getting rather full of himself. Bellingham placed his hand on Isabel's hip. His messenger can wait until I am finished. Take your hand off her, you foul horson. Of course, sir, I said. Isabel set the lather brush in the bowl, her face hard as stone. Since you're here, Curzon, there is mud dried on my good blue coat. Take care of it. He patted Isabel's backside. Be quick, Isabel. The greens will arrive soon. As Isabel reached for the razor, Bellingham closed his eyes, as was his custom whilst being shaved. He did not see the way she gripped the handle of the blade or the look in her eyes. She was not going to shave his whiskers. She was going to slice open his throat. Two thoughts collided in my mind like cannonballs, that I would cheer when the job was done and that I had to stop her because our punishment would be swift and merciless. The latter thought carried more force and drove me into action. Mr. Bellingham, sir, if I may, I quickly crossed the room. Isabel knows how to pluck chickens and shear sheep, but not how to shave the face of a gentleman. On another occasion, it might not matter if your face was nicked or if a patch of whiskers was overlooked, but it will today. Allow me, sir, so that you might look your best. I put out my hand for the blade. I suppose you're right, Bellingham sighed and patted Isabel again. Give it to him, girl, then ask the cook if she has any of that cobbler left. Isabel handed me the razor. The horn handle was sweaty and warm. Bellingham studied her backside as she rinsed her hands and dried them on her apron. I held up the blade so that it flashed in the light from the window. May I, sir? Of course, he said, closing his eyes again and tilting back his head. What else is being done to prepare for the greens' arrival? I asked the cook to bake up a nutmeg cake, Isabel said. It is said to be Mrs. Green's favorite. Excellent notion, Isabel, Bellingham said. Find out what General Green prefers on his plate, too. Our interests lie with him now, instead of the congressman. We must do whatever we can to ensure his comfort and keep his wife con con uh, content. I shall learn all that I can, sir, Isabel said. Good girl, he pointed at his face. Make haste, Curzon. The soap is drying and it itches. That Bellingham. All right, um, a shortish chapter, but make some good jots and we will discuss tomorrow. Thanks.